It's great to have combined people. We have both services here, and it's a dedication so that you have an opportunity to actually do something. You have, you have an opportunity to come forward. We normally don't do that, and that's what makes it special. It's also special because it's Thanksgiving. It's special because we have so much to be thankful for. And so on this particular weekend, we combine these, these metaphors as to what are we trying to do with stewardship and thanksgiving and, and defining our lives by generosity. And I have, I've looked through the scriptures and I thought, well, I have a lot of one-liners that I want to give you. And the very first one I found was this wonderful little passage in Proverbs. It's two verses right here in chapter 11. So listen to God's word to you. One person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word and your words, we pray that you would open up all of our hearts and help us to understand better how we can be generous in our lives in a thankful lifestyle that we have. And on this Thanksgiving Day, to share these blessings with others. May the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let's go back to Thanksgiving. So we started Thanksgiving way back in 1621. You remember the English Puritans and the Wapanoag Indians are getting together to give thanks and they share a meal together and certainly for overcoming difficulties and the hardship of winters and and so that's what we go back to but you know in 1777 after the Revolutionary War the Battle of Saratoga there was also a declaration that we would have a national Thanksgiving Fast forward about a hundred years and President Lincoln in 1865 said the very same thing on the last Thursday of November, here it is, 1865, the Civil War is over and we're going to have a National Day of Thanksgiving. Every president from that year on declared a National Day of Thanksgiving until 1941 when the Congress actually ratified an annual Thanksgiving. They changed the date to the fourth Thursday of November and that's what we're celebrating. But isn't it interesting? that often Thanksgiving has then been born out of adversity and of difficult times. Three major changes that I shared with you all came about during or after a war. It's somewhat of a paradox, isn't it? In times of plenty, we become somewhat indifferent. The smallest gifts are overlooked and underappreciated. But let hard times come. And the threat that these gifts might be taken away from us. And we are jolted into sudden recognition and gratitude. Well, here it is, Thanksgiving weekend coming up. And here it is that there's a, also a relationship not only between Thanksgiving and adversity, but between being thankful and being generous. Just last Friday, I know that many of you participated in the annual Extraordinary Giving. When I checked it early this morning, they were at $6.1 million. Isn't that fantastic? Last Friday, <laughs> online giving in our community. And here we are, again, on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, which is our tradition to have a dedication service, a celebration of our dedication and relationship with God. And so that leads to another Proverbs verse, those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Thanksgiving, as we said, began with sharing a meal between the Indians and the pilgrims. Today, Thanksgiving is probably about sharing a meal and our blessings with others, with those whom you love. Uh, the, some of our family will get together, as I'm sure that some of yours will. But also, Thanksgiving is about sharing blessings with some people you don't even know, 
who you know have a specific need or have a need of at least some blessing in their life. And you can be a part of that. I love one of those, uh, all the sayings of Winston, Sal uh, Winston Churchill are great, but one of the favorites about generosity is this one. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And when God created us, He created us to be generous. All through scriptures, Old Testament and New, we are taught to give to others, to the poor, to the needy, to the widows, to our neighbor, to the house of God, our churches, as those created in the image of God. Part of that image is the willingness to give. For God so loved the world that he gave, is what it says. And as we have spoken in the last couple of weeks about presenting reality, creating hope, and building a legacy, I want part of my legacy to be that others would say of me when I am long gone, he lived what Jesus taught. As we saw in Acts a couple of weeks ago, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The more we become people following Jesus, the more we allow the Holy Spirit to become a part of our lives every day, the less we think about ourselves and the more we think about other people. We see things in a new way, as an opportunity to do something for someone else, and not just ourselves. You saw that on Friday. You, you, I'm sure that many of you, just like when I was in front of the computer, it filled my heart with joy to know that I could make a difference in someone else's life by a click of the button on my computer and donating something from my credit card. And I know it gave you real joy in your heart as well. Defining your life by generosity is learned <clears throat> by practice. The more we give, the more generous our hearts become. And the more our hearts are filled with joy. Which leads to the next verse that you're very familiar with from Paul's letter, Corinthians. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In the Old Testament, God's people were taught to give some portion of the very best that they had to God. Now, in the beginning, they would give what was called a burnt offering, which of course meant that no portion of the offering was saved. It was as if to say, God, I'm giving this to you, and it's all yours. And then in later times, with the tabernacle and the temple, the people would bring their gifts to the priests, and would offer them to God and to the spiritual ministries taking place. And these were called first fruits. And they would equal a tenth of that person's crops or flocks or income. Now the practice of giving a tenth, a tithe, is attributed way back to Abraham when Abraham actually gave a tenth after, of the spoils of war to the glory of God to that mysterious priest-king figure called Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Tithing became codified when you get to Moses so that as we see in this verse from Leviticus, it says, all tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. Now Christians, as you know, are not bound by the law. But most sources would agree that tithing 
is still a good guideline to follow. Now this is old news to some of you. Some of you have been tithing all your lives. Someone taught you early, like someone taught Dee Dee and me, that it was best to write up an annual budget for your personal account. And then at the very top of the list, to put God's tithe. Now that hasn't always been easy for us. In the mid-1980s, in my first pastorate in East Tennessee, we just had our second child, and I was making $14,000 a year with two children, middle of the 1980s. But you know, somehow we continued to tithe, and somehow with God's help, we got through that. And we had another child, and we stopped. Maybe tithing is just not possible for you at this time. Maybe 3% or 5% or 7%. But it's the beginning step of a life that is defined by generosity. Now I know a tithe, the concept of tithing is challenging to almost everybody. <clears throat> we were just talking about this. The average charitable giving in our nation is just over 2%, regardless of whether you go to church or not. And the best illustration I have found on tithing <clears throat> is by David Slagle, who's a pastor in Decatur, Georgia, and he uses apples as an illustration. So imagine that God has given us ten apples, which represent our wealth or our income. And there are nine apples here for us to enjoy. Family, housing, retirement, food, savings, nine of them. But then there's this one apple. And this one apple right here is holy to God. Giving this apple to God first before we consume the other nine apples is a way for us to express praise and love and obedience, faithfulness and worship, our devotion to God. And this apple here also serves to supply the resources for God's purposes to be accomplished in the world through God's church. But our lives are such that, <clears throat> for many of us, nine apples aren't enough anymore. And we think, how can I pay all these bills and have all the stuff that I want with just these nine apples? And so we decide that the Lord will not mind if we take a little bit of this apple here. After all, there's that trip that we want to go to, so well, why don't we just take a, a bite out of that apple? You know, that apple, the one that we said is holy to God and for the purposes of God in this world? But the Lord will understand, we think. And then Christmas comes, and we don't have enough money for all the presents that we want to buy, so, well, let's, let's take another little bite out of this apple. And, well, then there's that medical emergency that we didn't set any savings to help us with, and, well, we need a newer car, and then we're going out to eat a lot, and each expense takes a bite out of the apple that belongs to God. And you know... Soon all that's left is the core. And we give the core to God and we say, here's your portion, God. So God doesn't receive our first fruits or our best fruits. God receives our leftovers. 
Now, a strange thing happens when you give this first apple to God. You see, we're not tempted to eat it anymore because it's not there. And with God's help, somehow we figure out how to live on these nine apples. Now, contrary to popular belief, tithing is possible at any level. But most of us agree that it is probably more difficult the wealthier you are. According to Forbes magazine, there are 950 billionaires in the world today, and almost all of them give in single digits to charity, under 10%. And you're starting to wonder, how much is enough to live on? If you can't give more than 10% as a billionaire, what are you spending your money on? The truth is, regardless of our income, each of us is faced with the very same question. How many apples is enough? As nine apples grow to 20 apples and 20 apples grow to 40 apples, we basically have two questions. Excuse me, we basically have two choices. Store the apples in storehouses or share them with somebody else. Peter Marshall, who, as you know, was the chaplain of the Senate, tells a wonderful story on stewardship. There was a man who struggled with tithing, and he was very wealthy. And he came up to Marshall and he said, I have a problem. I used to be a tither. And, well, now I have a bit of a problem. You see, now I make $500,000 a year, and, well, there's just no way that I can afford to give $50,000. And Marshall reflected on this wealthy man's dilemma, but gave no advice. He simply said, I can certainly see your problem. Why don't we pray about it? To which the man agreed. And so then Marshall bowed his head and he prayed with boldness and authority, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would reduce this man's salary back to the place that he can afford to tithe. <laughs> which leads to the next verse. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Adam Hamilton, in his book Enough, he writes about a study that he'd done on the practice of worship. 1,600 years of biblical history. And he was surprised to find that in earliest times, the primary way that people worshiped God was not to sing praises of song to God, and, and certainly not to listen to a 20-minute sermon. The central act of worship was building an altar and offering the fruit of one's labors upon it to God. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they gave a burnt offering, burning the animal or grain as a way of expressing their gratitude, their devotion, their desire to honor God. And it's that deliberate act of dedication is what was most pleasing to God, not the scent of the burning offer. Now, Hamilton relates a story to this deliberate act of dedication. He and his family were going on a family camping trip, and it was over his birthday. And he 
told each child that he would give them $20 of spending money, but that's all they get for the whole time of vacation. And on the very first day, his eight-year-old daughter Becky came up to him because they went to the camp store and she found a baseball cap that she just had to have. And no amount of discussion would dissuade her from buying this baseball cap and blowing all $20 of it. Wouldn't have any spending money for the rest of the week. Gave her the $20 and let her buy it. And later that night, as they were sitting on a picnic table looking at the sunset, right in front of a lake, Becky takes out of the bag the baseball cap and says, I bought this for you, Dad, because I wanted to say I love you. Happy birthday. Hamilton, with tears in his eyes, thought about the daughter's sacrifice that she gave to him. She spent all her money so she could tell her dad, I love you. It is still one of his most prized possessions. Now that's how God looks at your offerings. They're not financial transactions. They're not business deals you're making with God. Your offering and your pledge on this dedication Sunday well, it's like coming forward in a deliberate act of dedication. And it's you saying, God, I'm returning a portion of what I have and what I've earned to say thank you and to say I love you. And I hope you'll use this somehow to make a difference in this world. Those are words of life defined by generosity. May they be your words on this dedication Sunday and every day. Amen.